Hi everybody, for this week I'm taking a little bit of a diversion. I'm having you read a few chapters, three chapters, from a book called Collaborating to Manage by Robert Agronoff. And so in this lecture I kind of want to get at why I'm doing that and um, talk about what we're going to do next week. So first of all, why am I taking this diversion? Well, one of the reasons I want to take this diversion is because Agronoff, uh, for one thing, Agronoff is, is really a scholar of collaboration. So he's written several books, a lot of articles about collaboration. Um, I'm having you read from one of his books, but there are several other books. And and what one of the things Agronoff really focuses on in his, his research is the local level of government and the collaboration that goes on the intersectoral collaboration that goes on locally. <clears throat> and I think that's an important topic for us as public administrators. So this week I'm having you just read three chapters from this Agronoff book. You notice I I um, copied some under fair use and um, having you read those. You can read the whole book, it's in the library and his other books as well. Um, but this actually does connect to federalism, and I'm, and I'm going to talk about that, why that is a connection. And then I want to talk a little bit about the what Agronoff calls the conductive organization. And I want to touch on just really briefly, because we're public administrators and nonprofit administrators, um, what what changes in management skills we should we should all be going through. Old people like me. Um, really should be changing our management skills. Younger public and nonprofit administrators really ought to be trained in new skills um, and, and trained in a different way of thought than is classically thought public administrators think. So let me get, get right to that. So let me let me dive more into this question of why am I taking this diversion? Um, I am because uh, something we've talked a lot about a lot is federalism um, and and really when we talk about federalism a lot of it I think is pretty theoretical so I mean I have an, a, a question myself um, as to whether what we conceive of as federalism as this wall between levels of government whether that's realistic I I have a follow-on question which is uh, whether or not the founders, when they wrote the Constitution and, and really devised American federalism, whether they really had it fully flushed out. I, I think the answer is no, um, but you can, you can disagree, certainly. Um, my point is that in, in several policy areas, and I talk about some of these, and we, we, we all talk about these when we get to the specialization part of the course, Emergency management, healthcare, housing and welfare. What we see in these areas is that networked relationships are common and they're probably necessary, although um, sometimes frustrating, right? Um, but I would also further assert here, and I think this is why I want you to read some of the Agronoff text, because Agronoff focuses on this. Much of the collaborative action, if you will, in intergovernmental management and in intergovernmental relations occurs at the local level, right? So that means when we get down to the local levels, um, we can see that um, even elected um, elected officials who are sometimes pejoratively called politicians because the word politician, I suppose, has more of a pejorative meaning these days. Um, but even at the local level, what we see is more collaboration and, and it's more pragmatic, right? So we see cities talking to cities. We see intergovernmental agreements on practical things like firefighting and policing. Um, but we also see collaborative action between sectors more at the city level. So we see cities collaborating with business in the for-profit sector. We see cities collaborating with the nonprofit sector. Uh, we see we see attempts at many city levels to involve more citizens in very actually concrete, pragmatic ways. And so what we 
we can take hope from, I think, is that um, at the local level, we we tend to see more more practical considerations of collaboration in order to meet these perceived common goals that we all might have as residents of this area. So the real question, you know, as for me as a teacher and for you as students is whether you as MPA graduates have the skill that you need to operate in this collaboration environment. And would you feel comfortable moving between sectors? So here's the federalism connection to Agronoff. Um, and Agronoff, you see, I quote Agronoff there in about uh, two places. Agronoff contends here on page 27, the dual federalism doctrine held that the national government and the states each were sovereign in certain spheres and that each of them exists and that between each of them exists areas of activity that neither can enter. But then he goes on to say that the second era epoch really of federalism proved to be a period of growing interdependency that linked state, local and federal governments. Right. So we've talked about that, we, you know, um, strict a walled off dual federalism has given way to more interdependency. Right. So I would also add that the evolution of social programs has led to this realization that some big central government like the federal government doesn't really effectively administer programs. And so success in the programs themselves, if we're just looking at the program as the as the unit of analysis, that success meant that reliance on state and local governments and their partners in nonprofit and for profit arenas. Um, th that's the way we found success, right? We had to do it. That is, these programs couldn't just be administered by this monolithic pyramid federal bureaucracy that we needed cooperation from other levels of government and from partners. And the last point I want to make with federalism is that program implementation really uh, depends on a variety of tools of government. This is Lester Salomon, his classic book in 2002, where he talks about the 2000 or talks about uh, the year 1999, actually in the federal government, that's the data he uses. But so it's kind of dated, it's 20 years old, but it still really applies his examination of what he calls the tools of government. So I would say that dual federalism, really, it's still around, right? Rumors of its demise are greatly exaggerated. Um, and so here's some typical examples of large government bureaucracies, right? The Department of Defense is, is the largest bureaucracy in the federal government, the largest single uh, bureaucracy. So it's it's pretty much fairly a, a pyramid shaped um, department. The Veterans Administration is really a single federal agency uh, that operates mostly through its own bureaucracy, although there's cracks in that, right? Social Security, at least the old age part. Um, so, you know, if, if you or your parents get a Social Security check, it's coming from the Social Security Administration. Nobody in the state uh, has much say of that. However, that said, the Social Security law itself, as passed in 1935 and then amended through all of its existence, um, is a huge social piece of legislation. In fact, it's probably the foundational piece of legislation for what we might call the United States, the American version of the welfare state. But the Social Security law itself really is the underpinning of all that. I mean, unemployment insurance is Title III and Title IX of the Social Security Act. Unemployment insurance is administered at the state level, but it was part of the Social Security law to begin with. Medicare, as passed in the 60s in the Johnson administration, that's Title um, 18 of the Social Security Act. Uh, Medicare is administered, or Medicare money comes through Social Security, you pay payroll taxes. However, Medicare itself is administered by the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, right? CMS, which is part of HHS. Um, Medicaid is administered by uh, HHS, right? Medicaid is administered at state level. So, 
while Social Security itself is really a great example of a single federal agency, the many programs in the law are actually administered through other agency and other departments. Uh, intelligence agencies, as in the FBI and the CIA, internal and external, really kind of stand out as um, single vertical, vertically integrated um, federal bureaucracies except that the FBI also involves itself with local police departments. But those things said, you know, these these agencies are really mostly large government bureaucracies at the federal level. And we still see typical examples of state dominance, and they're still active. So typical wildlife and fish and game departments at the state level, state parks, state level law enforcement, right? Um, there are typical examples of local dominance, like local law enforcement, local zoning and growth regulation, local parks and roads, and that we can see variants state to state and city to city in these kinds of issues. So the idea that dual federalism itself is or should be completely done away with, really, that, that's exaggerated. So let me kind of switch gears here a little bit. And this, this kind of gets to my question about skills. So we're students of public administration and as students of public administration, you know, we read all about what Luther Gulick had to say in the 1930s. So Luther Gulick um, really focused on how government agencies should be organized. Gulick himself thought that if you can just organize correctly, then the organization itself should be able to take care of whatever the mission was. And so Gulick came up with this acronym called POSDECORP. And what he said was that the head of any uh, vertically integrated bureaucracy in government has these tasks that are done. So every head, whether the person is the Secretary of Defense or the Secretary of the Interior, or the Secretary uh, you know, of State, every one of those secretaries has these tasks they do. They do planning, organizing, staffing, directing, coordinating, reporting, and budgeting. They don't share those with other organizations. Now, why is that? That's because in, in his vision, you know, the, the ideal bureaucracy, which was a good thing, by the way, not a bad thing, but the ideal bureaucracy um, was really again vertically integrated so top-down management became sort of the stereotype of how programs are implemented and so we took what Gulick believed to be a, a positive uh, a positive thing and we really care you know we, we turned it into a caricature right um, so we we talk about bureaucracy and we talk about bureaucrats and we say that protecting the boundaries of the bureaucracy was not only a vital skill of a bureaucrat, but they do that to their detriment, right? And so these these top-down organizations are, are rule-bound, and they really can't see outside the walls of their own little their own little pyramid. But that is a caricature in a sense, and especially when we start talking about collaboration, um, the manager of a government-like organization has some of these skills, but these are not the primary skills that they possess. And at least, according to Agronoff, these skills should be modified a bit. So what changed, you know, to make me say that the POSDICORB set of skills uh, really aren't the most vital set of skills? Um, well, one is resources, right? So governments have been forced to look for alternatives to, to direct government provision. So if you consider government as just a series of, of vertically integrated bureaucracies, that really is inefficient in a sense because if each organization has to have enough capacity to organize that way, then there's capacity that could be used elsewhere, right? So it's inefficient. Um, what else changed? The regulatory environment changed. So there's more laws and there's more regulations per policy area. And what that means is that various agencies have to become involved in the enforcement of those regulations. And then there's the implementation environment, right? So what we have seen 
really kind of as a part of American culture is resistance to central government control at the local level. So, you know, we don't want the federal government running our schools, for example. Um, and, and that really is a, a part of our philosophy of government. Um, and that leads to this idea that that these programs should be distributive in nature uh, and not top down in nature. Um, and so we see that um, the federal government is involved, but it becomes involved in different ways. And so here's some of the ways I I'm talking about. And I'm going to show you a chart from Salomon here in just a second. But, um, you know, about 21.3 percent of the U.S population participates in some kind of means-tested government assistance, whether that's Medicaid or SNAP or other programs. And all those are administered in slightly different ways that involved, um, you know, some kind of tool. Um, about 20% of the population receives some kind of social security benefit, and that is growing as the baby boomers age. Um, the majority of mortgages in this country right now are backed by the federal government. I don't know if most people realize that the majority of mortgages are backed by the federal government through FHA or VA or some other program. Uh, about 35% of student loans are backed by the federal government. And, and so those two last examples are examples of things that are not direct government. So I sat down, I thought of some programs that require networks and uh, I would say, look at uh, what Agronoff is saying, not all connections between agencies are networks. And he, he has a typology on page 38 and 39. But Medicaid requires a network, right? So Medicaid is a federal program, but it's also a state program. And so it involves connections and a network between uh, federal agencies, state agencies, and providers at the very least, not to mention patients. Medicare which is more which is more top down in a sense because it doesn't involve the states but medicare still involves federal provider uh, it, it involves providers it involves private insurance and it involves the patients again right the national guard that's off the subject of health care but the national guard um the nebraska national guard is a network between the the federal government, that is the Army and the Air Force, the state of Nebraska, and employers. So a national, one of the big things that the head of a state National Guard, the adjutant general of the state National Guard has to do, really, is continue to collaborate with employers, especially when we have National Guard troops that deploy two and three and four and five times um, and, erst, and have erstwhile employers private employers, how do we manage those networks? Um, so the Affordable Care Act, which has changed a lot and is still under change, right? But as originally written, the Affordable Care Act was really written as something that was supposed to try to promote networks. Whether it did that successfully or not is another question, but that's how it was written. So we had an individual mandate. Everybody has to have health insurance. And then we had these healthcare exchanges which were run by states or the federal government. But the vision was that every state would have a, an exchange. And that was supposed to be coupled with Medicaid expansion uh, so that people who earned up to 133% of the federal poverty level uh, could, could have uh, support to get insurance. Um, then we have participating insurance providers, right? Who they had a chance to become part of the exchanges and offer at least three different levels of policy. And then we had employers. There was, a, there was an employer mandate as well. So really, in a sense, um, whether you see the Affordable Care Act as a government takeover of insurance or whether you see it as a needed way for people to get health insurance, the fact of the matter is, as it was written, it was supposed to be promoting networks between the federal government, the state governments, uh, private for-profit insurance companies, employers, most of whom are for-profit employers, and uh, medical providers. So uh, 
that was that was how it was written. It's supposed to be a, a series of networks. Um, the, another example is housing and rural development programs. We see these both at HUD and USDA, right? Um, and then we have economic development programs at state level. So those of you who have worked for the legislature or, or in state government realize that the state itself from a state level tries to encourage economic development. And so we, we have various agencies in the state government that, that try to do that. Some are grant granting type agencies. Some are really just um, capacity building agencies, but they try to work with cities and sectors to actually engage in economic development. And I really could add, even at the local level, um, that economic development becomes a networked uh, effort. So you don't really have to look much farther than Exarbent Village to see kind of the public-private collaboration that has gone on to make that that area uh, viable. And, and that has been a network between the city, the state, as in the University of Nebraska, uh, and private developers. So this chart is from the famous Salomon book, which is 20 years old now. But what Salomon was talking about, and it still applies, is that most of the work that the federal government does is not direct government. So this stereotype, this caricature of the vertically integrated bureaucracy that comes in and tries to do everything to everyone is really not how government works at the federal level. Um, so you notice in this chart from Salomon, he talks about direct government and indirect government. And what his contention was, again, he studied one budget year, but you could apply this across any budget year. What his contention was, was that indirect government is, is really more than two thirds of the expenditure of the federal government, right? The, the federal government itself does very little provision of goods and services. Um, it does a lot of income support, um, but it does other things that are more indirect in nature. Contracting, grants, vouchers, tax expenditures, loan guarantees, government sponsored enterprises, deposit insurance. So all those things, how are all those things implemented? They are not implemented directly necessarily by the federal government. Often they are implemented through other sectors, through the nonprofit sector, through the for-profit sector. So think of loan guarantees. Um, I have, as a veteran, I I have a mortgage, and it is backed by the Veterans Administration. Okay, so the Veterans Administration did not give me a loan. The Veterans Administration did not deal with the bank. All the Veterans Administration did was provide a certificate that said, this person is indeed a, a veteran who is eligible for a Veterans Administration mortgage. And so I have a mortgage that I, you know, got through a bank and I went through all the closing actions with the title company, just like anybody else. And so all those entities are for-profit companies and I pay my mortgage on time. And so Wells Fargo is, their reward is they get the money I pay in interest, right? If I ever decide to default on that loan, if I walk away from my house, then the Veterans Administration would be on the hook. However, implementation of the loan itself has nothing to do with the Veterans Administration. And so this is what Salomon is talking about. So what Agronoff does, um, and this is table 2.1 in chapter three, um, this is interesting. Oh, chapter two, I'm sorry. What's interesting about this is, is um, Sal, or Agronoff takes what Salomon said. He takes the tools of government and he calls them collaborative, collaborative tools. And then he gives examples of how these would work. So here's how I'd like you to read this chart. So um, you can you can go to, to table 2.1 in the book and and kind of look at this and see what he's talking about. So start, you see I put those numbers up there. Um, start in the middle, start where it says core sponsored jurisdiction and read down that column. And so you see that a lot of programs have have some kind of sponsor government or jurisdiction, right? So 
Um, let's look at the first one. The first one says the core sponsor jurisdiction is county government. So he's saying this notionally. So go to number two at the top of my table here. And so what are we talking about? We're talking about a direct government service. Okay, what's the description of a direct government service? Direct government service is a good or service provided by a public agency, that is by a government, right? And what's the example he's talking about? The example in this case is this Jefferson County Public Health Department, which operates an inoculation program. So this, this public health effort to inoculate citizens is done by this Jefferson County Public Health Program. Right, so you can see this is a pretty easy example of a direct government contact, right? So the county government is paying for this, they're providing it, but then let's jump to number five, who the major partners are. He has FSL, that means federal, state, local. So F is federal, S is state, L is local, and then he also has nonprofit NP and for profit FP. So he says the partners are federal, state, and local, right? So there's probably some funding from federal government, but the sponsor itself is the county government. So who are the other involved organizations, however? He says, that's number six, the far right column. He says schools, home nurses association, other voluntary organizations. So we used to actually have these more community-wide uh, immunization efforts right so some of the more famous ones were the polio vaccine in the 1950s uh, once we discovered that we could vaccinate against polio there were these huge community-wide polio vaccine efforts right and so people would go line up at a school and they would all get the children would all get polio vaccines right well the people giving the shots were often volunteers right and lots of times they weren't being paid they were nurses they were doctors, they were other healthcare workers who were collaborating with this direct government intervention. So that's a, a good example of collaboration. Um, let's go down to the second one and talk about a, a program that is funded really and sponsored by the federal government, maybe not funded, but so the federal government has regulations about clean water, right? Um, and so start there at uh, in the middle, number one, federal government, then jump over to the left. What are we talking about? We're talking about regulation. So jump to number three. What does a regulation do? A regulation sets a standard or prohibits something, right? So it says uh, so many parts per million of certain compounds, arsenic, lead, other things in the water. Okay, so what's the example? The example is municipal clean drinking water standards. Now, I have to admit this. I used to tell people um, that you could drink any tap water in the United States and it would be safe because of the regulation. Well, obviously Flint, Michigan proved that I was inaccurate on that statement, so I no longer say that. But we see in the research that there are some other uh, cities where clean drinking water is not necessarily assured even though regulations exist that say clean water has to be available. So something's going wrong. What is that thing? Um, go over to the column five, which I label as column five. Who are the partners in, in clean water? Well, there's the federal regulation, there's states, which also have regulations. There's local governments, which typically are the provider of the water. And there's nonprofit and for-profit because some states actually have for-profit water companies some cities have for-profit water companies and they have to abide by the regulation but who are other involved organizations right so homeowners contractors school districts counties they all have to take part in this right um when i when you build a house the plumbing has to be up to code right um sewer systems have to be up to code. So what we're seeing here is is more um, collaboration, right? So let's go to just one more example, and that's way down almost uh, 
a little more than halfway through, almost two thirds of the way through tax expenditure. So what is a tax expenditure? A tax expenditure is when the government doesn't charge a tax that it otherwise could charge, right? And so that's called a tax expenditure. Um, and it's often listed as, as an, on the expenditure side of, of the balance sheet. So who typically at the local level sponsors tax expenditures? That would be city governments, county governments, or private developers. Okay, so in that context, what are we talking about? So if you've heard the word TIF, tax increment financing, that's a great example of a tax expenditure at the local level. So let's go back to the first column again, where it says tax expenditure and move over to the second column. That is a cash incentive or a tax incentive, I would say, to encourage a project or program outside of government, right? So his hypothetical example is Chico, California, providing 15% of the cost of a new office complex in the core of the city. Well, how's it gonna do that? It's probably gonna do that. It could be doing that through TIF financing. So we see, we have seen TIF financing in Nebraska used quite a bit, right? Um, the, the partners in this are typically local levels of government and the private sector, right? But some other involved organizations are contractors, building material companies, labor unions, and downtown Chico in his example. but let me talk about TIF financing. The way TIF financing works is that a local government, say a city, will declare a certain tract of land blighted. This is what happens in Nebraska. So the city of Omaha can declare uh, a particular tract of land blighted. So what do they mean by that? Do they mean that everything is horrible? What they really mean is that in the state it's in, nobody's gonna build there. And so therefore the property value of that tract of land will never increase. It won't attract, it probably won't attract further businesses. And so the land itself will become of little value both publicly and in terms of the private sector economic development. So a city declares a tract of land blighted and then says we're, we're going to do TIF financing. So what it tries to do is entice someone to build on that tract of land. And usually it will start with a particular project. And so what's the TIF have to do with it? Here's what happens. If you take any block of land, so take 72nd and Dodge, this, this area of crossroads, for example, if we say that is blighted, then what we mean is we say it's blighted and we try to entice someone to come in and build something, a major kind of anchor development there. So what we're telling them when they do that is that we might exempt them uh, from property tax, or we might say that you only have to pay property tax up to the level that originally exists for X number of years, for eight years or 15 years or 23 years or something like that. So what we're saying is if, if the property tax attached to that property at 72nd at Dodge was $40,000, then all we're going to make you pay for this term, this TIF term is $40,000 a year. Even though once you build this development, the property value itself will continue to be higher and higher. So the assessor will come along and say, you know, it, it was worth a million dollars. Now it's worth a million, 100,000. Now it's worth 2 million. Now it's worth 5 million. But for the term of that TIF, the developer's only gonna have to pay the original value. So what, what the sponsoring government is gonna do is turn around and take that increment of that increment of tax that it could have got and pour it back into the development. Pour it back into the development in terms of infrastructure or, or something else. Now, for the other governments that are collecting property taxes, that would be things like the school board, they don't benefit because as the property, as the property um, increases in value, they're not getting more property tax valuation from it. They're only getting the original amount. Nevertheless, it's seen as a positive, as a net positive, because in the long run, it has spillover effects, which might be things like further economic development in that area. And so further economic development really results in more taxes. That is, people might come there and buy things, pay sales tax, or there might be other um, property develop development around there, which leads to higher assessments and higher property taxes, which these governments gain. So that's the whole incentive behind TIF financing. And 
it really is a great example of a collaboration. So in chapter three, Agronoff talks about this thing called the conductive organization, not conducive, but conductive organization, right? So think of conductive as moving current, moving electricity. Um, so what he means by that is that this conductive organization is less hierarchical, it's less uh, rule bound, um, it has less protection of organizational boundaries and more use of boundary spanning. And in this conductive organization, we see a need really in terms of skills of managers for an update to Posdecorp. So this is what Agronoff talks about in figure 3.5 when he talks about Posdecorp. So what he's saying is, this is how I would translate Posdecorp today if I were doing it in a collaborative environment. So planning, instead of just planning for the organization, is based on a vision and it's adaptable. Organizing is not necessarily the first thing you do. Unlike Gulick, you don't sit down and say, this is how the organization should be put together. You're actually organizing as you go along. You're organizing how your collaboration works as you go along because you're very flexible. Staffing is based on knowledge rather than rank. So this is the idea that we should flatten organizations and we should become more um, knowledge based rather than job title based. Directing um, is based more on self direction and facilitating knowledge rather than uh, dictating to people how to do their job. Coordinating is the idea that it's always going on. It's not necessarily sequential. It's something that is always going on. Reporting is based on mutual exchange of problems, progress, and results, right? And budgeting is ad hoc. And actually, this might be a danger. Uh, in a collaborative enterprise, there's rarely one budget, but there are several budgets. And so in a sense, that becomes harder to take care of. So the question that I have is, do we possess the skills? Um, so do managers require both internal and external skills and do they have them? Do managers have knowledge of other sectors? Um, do managers have knowledge of these agreements and these boundary spanning devices that hold these networks together? Are managers vulnerable enough and willing enough to part with some of their turf? And so do managers have these network skills that um, Agronoff talks about of activation, framing, mobilizing, and synthesizing. So I'm just real quick, I, I have a couple pages from the reading, but I'm not going to go through these completely. You can you read it in the book and so study these diagrams, but but the here's the key element here. Right in the middle of this conductive, this hypothetical conductive public agency, um, there's a public agency whatever it is in the city, the Department of Planning. Um, and so you have the core operations of public agency. So in a sense, if I'm the planning director running the planning department at the city, I still have a department to run. So I still might be interested in positive corp, right? Because I have to run my department. I have to worry about my department budget. I have to worry about my department staffing. I have to worry about my department uh, outputs and so I'm running this agency but at the same time I'm running these agency I have all these connected collaborative partners and you can see these are all the dash lines surrounding my agency here so I have uh, advisory committees I have connections with for-profits and non-profits I have lateral relations with other agencies I have informal transactions with other governments I might have research and university contracts, right? I might have involvement in one or more networks, but I also have some formal uh, relationships that really have more accountability. That's that rectangle there. So I might have grants or regulatory procurement or loans to other governments. So I really have to follow up on those, right? So if I'm the planning department granting money to community associations or something like that really there are more rules attached to that but some of the other relationships are not as rule oriented and so he actually in the book talks about the usda rural development which is a great case study i'm not going to spend a lot of time on that in this lecture 
um, but please do read that. And then he finally talks about this idea, this school in Ohio, which is called Metro School, and, and talks about all the relationships that this Metro School has in the area in and around Columbus, Ohio. So, uh, you know, not the least of these is a relationship with the uh, Ohio State University who, who are involved uh, with faculty and other staff, right? Um, and so this is a great case study um, in chapter eight. I would really highly encourage you to read about Metro School, this network, um, because it's very encouraging um, to talk about what we could be doing with uh, K-12, with high school education. But it brings to mind a question that I have, and I'm going to get to these in a second. Here's my question. Um, these are high, these are rhetorical questions. Look at my second rhetorical question. Are some networking trials, such as Metro School, feasible across the sector? So chapter eight is devoted to this Metro School in Columbus, Ohio, right? So my question is, is every high school in Columbus, Ohio going to have that kind of extensive network relationship with all these organizations, including Ohio State University? Is every high school in Omaha, Nebraska and the surrounding school districts going to have a relationship with UNO uh, that is is that formalized? And so I, I'm I think you can see I'm issuing a bit of a critique of chapter eight um, because I think that these trials are very encouraging on one hand, but on the other hand, can we actually apply some of this kind of collaboration across the sector? But my, here's my other questions uh, with regard to collaboration. How do managers become knowledge managers? How do they, I mean, how do we make you a knowledge manager? Um, how do we manage accountability of taxpayer, taxpayer funded programs when we're talking about collaboration? Right. So if we're talking about economic development and that involves some government money, which is taxpayer money and some private sector money and perhaps some nonprofit sector money, how do we maintain accountability? Right. How do we separate the streams of money in such a way that we can actually account for them? Uh, how do we find ways to bring in members of the public? Because we should if we're talking about collaboration, how do we find ways to bring in members of the public? Um, and this last question maybe is one that shouldn't be asked, but it is asked. How do, who, who do we give credit to when this goes great and who do we blame when it fails um, in collaboration? Because the point of collaboration is that we can actually share resources, but we also have to account for resources in separate ways. So all of that leads to this week's discussion question. And I'm actually asking you to maybe use a personal example or something that you're aware of. And that is, have you ever been involved in some kind of combination of government, nonprofit or for for profit entities? Um, and it doesn't have to involve all of those or could involve all of those. Um, and it could be in any sector, healthcare, emergency management, education, economic development. And I want you to describe uh, who you perceive to be the major players in the network and discuss whether the network achieved success and then what went right and what went wrong. So that's it for this week. Next week, we're going to talk about some practical examples of collaborative efforts. Thank you.